Well, New Hope, welcome, and those who are joining us live via simulcast in Bel Air, uh, welcome to you as well with our round of applause. We greet you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, turn in your uh, Bibles to the book of Jude. If you're brand new with us, uh, we are going verse by verse through this book. It's uh, just before the book of Revelation, contained on one page of the scripture. It is the fifth shortest book in the Bible, just 416 words long. And as we have been demonstrating over the past uh, four weeks and now the fifth week, uh, we begin uh, with scripture memory. We encouraged everyone here to memorize the book of Jude over the course of eight weeks. And we memorize it up to where we're at today, uh, which is through verse 13. And so we've asked uh, our uh, piano player today, Patty Dietlin, uh, who has memorized the book of Jude, uh, to memorize, uh, recite rather for you, uh, Jude chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Welcome, Patty, with your round of applause. Thank you, Patty. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I wanted to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into his license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know this, I want to tell, remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their place of authority, but left their own homes, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns um, brought themselves over to perversion and sexual immorality. They serve as an example of those who suffer the um, punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And the things that they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balin's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. They are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom darkest blackness has been reserved forever. Patty plays the piano, memorizes scripture, and cooks. What doesn't she do? She's just <laughs> amazing. Let's pray. Father, here, as we hear the sounds of rain, uh, we pray now for the movement of your Holy Spirit in our hearts so that it would refresh us like the rains refresh the ground. We are reading today, Lord, in your word about uh, people that are described as clouds without rain. The appearance of godliness, but lack its power. Uh, Lord, we are thankful today for your word. May it penetrate our hearts and accomplish the purpose for which you send it. Thank you for the word of God, which is uh, written and also has been declared publicly uh, through memory. 
May you take it now and accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the fifth sermon in a series we call Culture Creepers. Jude is concerned with the ways that culture is creeping into the church. He had wanted to write to them about something else. He said, I had long desired to write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith. And then he goes into verse four, for certain people have crept in. Uh, Not just people, but ways of thinking, ways of behavior, ways of talking that were perverting and corrupting the believers. A very simple way to understand Jude, if you're brand new with us this morning, uh, is this picture of the Bible, uh, is to understand the first whole section predominantly is dealing with creepers, things that are creeping into the church and affecting believers. We've talked through some of them, careless neglect, destructive arrogance, reckless selfishness, fruitless hypocrisy. At the end, he lumps together seven correctives, uh, seven correctives that we've gone through, some of which are progressive holiness, prayerful humility, missional mindset, and an act of faith. And then he ends with this glorious victory, now to him who is able to keep you from falling, and he points us to our hope of eternal life. That is the summary of the book of Jude. Verses 12 through 13 is a series of metaphors. He gives six of them. Uh, He says about the people that have crept into the church, he says, these are hidden reefs as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness is reserved forever. Everybody say, whoa. Okay, those are like big metaphors. Uh, The last two weeks, now we have talked about those metaphors. We broke them down into reckless selfishness. That is, they're hidden reefs, shepherds feeding themselves. Fruitless hypocrisy. They are waterless clouds swept along by winds. They are fruitless trees in late autumn. And today we cover these last two metaphors that he gives in verse 13. We're going to talk today about wild rebellion. The two metaphors that he gives is that they are wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Can you picture it? Oh, great. (laughs) Wandering stars, think shooting star. That's kind of the imagery. Shooting star for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. These last two metaphors he gives are of dangerous creeps who have crept in to the church. First, wild waves of the sea. Picture it, raging waves, chaos, unrest, uh, stirring up trouble. Um, You know them. Some of you have neighbors like that. Some of you have coworkers like that. And chances are, if you've been around the church any length of time, decade, 20 years or more, you have known church members like that. Jude's point is this. Listen close. Some people in the church are wild waves of rebellion stirring up trouble. Jude's point is this. Not everybody in the church is actually of the church. Let me say this again. This is big. Jude's concern for believers is that not everyone in the church is actually of the church. Just this morning, I was reading the words of Jesus in Mark or Matthew chapter 13. He tells a parable about a farmer who sows seed, and then the next day, an enemy comes into the field, and he sows weeds among the wheat. Jesus' point is that an enemy sows weeds among God's people. And this is Jude's concern. Not everyone in the church is, in fact, of the church. Some people in the church stir up trouble, they cause lots of problems, and they make the church seasick 
like wild waves of the sea. Have you ever been on a boat and been seasick? Uh, Labor Day weekend, we had the chance to go to Beaver Island. We took the ferry over from Charlevoix. Have you ever taken that ferry? With strong northwest winds, rolling waves of four to five feet. The boat was filled with children and adults and racers and dogs. And every single person was feeling the effects. Children puking in pizza boxes. Racers going over for the race, the half marathon, breathing in bags. (sighs) Two and a half hours of that. Wild waves. I'll come back to Beaver Island in a moment. Because something significant happened on that, which ties into this message. But Jude's point is that there are some people who are wild in behavior and speech. And he gives a very vivid imagery, casting up the foam of their own shame. Can you picture it? You're on the boat, you're looking out, the wild waves of the sea are raging, and it's filled with debris and pollution and foam. Isn't that a beautiful picture of foaming at the mouth? This is the imagery of those who pollute the church. They create disorder. They leave a path of ruin by the things they say. As a side note, those folks who are wild like that in God's church are almost always oblivious to the fact that they are wild. They think that they're carrying some sort of banner of truth. And if you tell them or confront them of their arrogance, they'll be like, (gasps) what? One of our pastors had to confront somebody not long ago and had to say to them, you are the most arrogant person I know. The response was, I've been told that before. And that's sad, isn't it? Here we're talking about wild rebellion creeping in the church. Jude's point is not on the outside. His his concern is not those outside the church. His concern is what has crept in the church. And we're going to make this very practical. And we're going to convict myself and all of us in a moment. Isn't that great? This is awesome. Wandering stars. Shooting. (laughs) Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Now, stars are normally trustworthy objects that don't move. In the old days, this is GPS at its best. Uh, They are fixed points of reference critical for navigation. But stars that are wandering or shooting stars, they may temporarily bring a sense of like wow and awe, but they are worthless when it comes to navigation. Shooting stars, wandering stars are unpredictable, unreliable, erratic worthless. Instead of true north, they are without direction. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know where they're going. Instead of being fixed and reliable points of reference, they are aimlessly wandering. It's interesting to note, however, that the direction of these shooting stars, as Jude sees it, is this. They are wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Everyone say, whoa. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's deep. Wild rebellion has crept in the church, and Jude points it out for what it is, and he says, hey, we, don't, we may not know where they're coming from. Uh, they, they come on the scene, they go off the scene, but make no mistake, the direction that they are heading is eternal destruction. This is his concern. These two metaphors describe creeps who wither their way into the church. They're troublemakers who create relational chaos. Back to Beaver Island. As we were on Beaver Island, we had the privilege of taking a tour of the historic island. And we came to one of the places, uh, not only did I hear this Labor Day weekend, I was able to confirm this uh, story this week with former residents of Beaver Island. There's a section of Beaver Island called Donegal Bay. It's on the northwest corner, so picture it. It's a gorgeous bay facing northwest. Fifty years ago, developers came along and they began to develop uh, Donegal Bay and tried to lure people in to purchase a piece of paradise on Beaver Island. They built a community pool 
but then they had to empty it because it was dangerous because kids were playing in it. They built a port on the water, but because it faced northwest, no docks were ever built because it was too dangerous for boats. And they built a stable for horses, but no horses ever came. And so the residents of Donico Bay developed T-shirts. And the T-shirts of Donico Bay residents said this, we are a pool with no water, a stable with no horses, and a port with no dock, and that's the way we like it. <laughs> Isn't that great? Let this be an instructive lesson for the church. Some people in the church are pools without water. They are stables without horses. They are ports without docks. They claim to be in the church, but they're not of the church. They are wandering stars who lead others astray. They are wild waves of the sea who create chaos and disruption. And just as they crept in in Judas's day, so they continue to creep in in every church in America today. And they would braggingly say, and that's the way we like it. Wild rebellion creeps in the church, number two, and it still creeps in today. Uh, let's make this message culturally relevant. Uh, where does wild rebellion creep in on the macro level? Where does it creep into our hearts? Where do we need to be aware? Uh, because our hearts as well are susceptible to wild rebellion. Uh, before I get into all of the pedantic details, uh, let, me, let me speak very candidly and practically to five groups of people. This might hit almost everyone here, one of these five, it may, it may not. But let me bring this home to five very specific groups of people. Some of you, us, have been hurt deeply by the arrogant talk of church members. By the way, when I get into these five, I'm panning out to your experience of church throughout your entire life. Some of this may date back 10 or 20 years. Some of us have been hurt deeply by the arrogant talk of church members. Can I just say on their behalf, because maybe they've never said it to you, I am sorry for the way some church members have talked to you. Second group of people. Some of us have been offended greatly by the prideful actions of a church leader pastor, elder. And if that's you, I want to say, I am sorry for the way that that former leader with arrogance and rebellion has hurt you. A third group, some of us are, have grown disappointed and cynical of the local church because of the reckless behavior of some who have shipwrecked relationships and have endangered the church. And if you have grown disappointed or cynical with the local church, can I just say, I am sorry for the reckless, wild behavior of some people who wave the banner of being a Christian but have acted like the devil. Fourth group, some of you have grown polluted or bitter because of the disruptive nature of church gossips can I just say I'm sorry for the way that they polluted you, casting up the foam of their shame, and may I encourage you to stand firm against the gossip and the slander. And a fifth group, some of us in our community, many have nearly given up on the local church, sliding into a de-church lifestyle because of the hypocrisy of those who claim the name of Jesus but deny him with their actions. And if that is you, if you have nearly given up on the local church, can I say that we serve a Savior who is trustworthy? And I'm sorry for the actions and the behaviors of wild rebels. I'm sorry. That's a great way to make this message practical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is, Craig. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Don't give up on Christ or his church just because of the foolish talk or behavior of one ungodly member or one ungodly pastor. 
the imagery came to me two weeks ago as I was reflecting upon the number of de-churched in our community. And here's the imagery. It would be silly uh, to stop pursuing medical care for your entire life just because of one doctor who had bad bedside manners. And in the very same way, it would be silly or foolish to give up on the local church just because of one bad pastor or one bad church member. Don't give up on Jesus. Keep loving him. Let's make this practical as well. Where else does wild rebellion sneak in? How does it subtly creep in and affect all of us? Uh, I'm reading a book right now called You Found Me. It's by Richard Richardson. Uh, It explores the current dilemmas facing the American church. It also explores reasons behind, kind of the the statistics behind why people are becoming de-churched or what are the factors involved in them being unchurched. As he explores the different dilemmas uh, facing the church, he kind of gets to the, to the core issue, the greatest dilemma, but he, he gets there this way. One of the dilemmas facing the local church is what he calls the rise of nuns. Now, this is not N-U-N-S. This is N-O-N-E-S, the rise of nuns or the nunning of America. Nuns are the fastest growing religion or the religious demographic in America. These folks are not anti-God, they're not anti-church, they're not anti-Christian. They simply just don't care. In one research, one poll from 2007 to 2014, so just in seven years, the percentage of Americans who identified as nuns went from 16% to 23%. So let me put this on the bottom shelf for all of us. 23% of Americans in 2014 identified themselves as nuns. That is that they just don't care. Let me make this very practical. Take four people in America, out of every every four people, one of them simply finds the church and God to be irrelevant. Everybody say "That's that's a big problem. But it's not the greatest problem. Richard Richardson talks about the second dilemma, failed pastoral leadership. Somebody should say amen, really bold for that one. Amen. Yeah, so stop it. All right. He says pastors are so busy running the church, they have actually neglected their fundamental calling of instructing and shepherding the church. One of the quotes that he gives in this book is, is, uh, is a powerful quote for those of us who are involved in pastoral leadership. He says, one of the problems is too many pastors are consumed with running the organization rather than reproducing faith and action in people. It is a problem. But it is not, he says, the greatest problem. The greatest problem, as he boils it down to the core issues facing the American church is this. It is a secularized, worldly church. I read this and I underline it and I highlighted it and I bring it to you. He says the greatest problem churches face is not the nunning of America, but rather the nunning and secularizing of the church. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying this. He's saying what Jude is calling to our attention, that culture is creeping in and it is making the church worldly and ungodly. This is Jude's central concern. And as he focuses the lens for today on wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever, This is where we need to take an assessment. Where have I become or where am I prone to this type of wild rebellion? This is the part of the message where I convict all of us. Isn't this exciting? (laughs) This just makes you eager, like what's next? Well, here's 10, just a sampling of 10 different ways. This is me and my study reflecting how does wild rebellion affect all of us? Here's 10. 
uh, our tearing down of others, whether it's in conversation or in social media. My friends, that is wild rebellion. Our contempt towards authority, parents, bosses, leaders. Our apathy towards God's word. It may look like you don't care, but that's rebellion. Next, our failure as pastors to lead God's church our disregard for accountability to church leadership, our adopting of worldly values in vacation land, our spreading gossip to make others look bad, our victim mentality that shifts blame, our refusal to receive correction, our lack of courage to confront worldliness. These are just a sampling of the ways that wild rebellion can so subtly creep in and affect our lives. Such wild rebellion is rarely easy to see. It's rarely easy to identify. It's rarely admitted to. Like children at Halloween who come disguised and dressed up in their costume, so wild rebellion often comes dressed up and disguised, and it looks like it's wearing a suit on Sunday morning. It is hard to identify wild rebellion It's hard to admit to, but a tree is indeed known by its fruit. And over the course of time, even somebody who professes to be a believer in Jesus Christ will be known and clearly known by the damage they leave in their wake. This is Jude's concern. Let me tell you about my brother-in-law. He's a pastor in a local church. I just spent time with him this past weekend. Over the last two years, they've been... As a church leadership, they've been navigating the challenges of a wild wave, a wandering star within their church congregation. Guess what? The guy is married, he's a deacon, he leads the annual church retreat, but he has displayed characteristics of rebellion and rejection of authority. They've confronted him about his behavior. He's emotionally abusive in his marriage, but the guy won't repent. He's divisive in the local church among members. He spreads gossip about leadership, but yet he won't repent. Every time the leadership has confronted him over the last two years, he comes with some sort of a victim mentality. Well, I'm not the one at fault. I'm not the one to blame. And he continues a perpetual pattern of division and destruction in the local church. This is not an outsider. He's in the church. Six months ago, that leadership came to the painful but necessary decision to remove the man from fellowship because he was proving himself to be what Jude talks about. Do you know what Jude describes these people as? Here's the descriptions Jude gives of these people in the church. He says that they are ungodly, worldly, and devoid of the spirit. Does that sound like a, like a non-believer? Go ahead and answer. Does it sound? It does. They're in the church. Jude says that they are worldly, ungodly, and devoid of the spirit. This church, after dealing with this man for two years, came to the conclusion he claims to be a believer, but he is worldly, he's ungodly, and he's devoid of the spirit. They removed this deacon from the local church. Consistent with what Titus says, warn a brother once, warn him twice, after that have nothing to do with him. Remarkable. What has transpired in the last six months in the church? Uh, Go ahead and ask me. Say, what's happened in the last six? Wow, you guys are so engaged today. Here's what's happened in the last six months since the guy has been removed. He has continued to be divisive in the new church he's going to, but my brother-in-law's church has become calm, peaceful. It's growing numerically. The believers in Jesus Christ have been restored to peace and trust. And mute. It is amazing, isn't it, how much poison one person can infect a group of believers, isn't it? And it is powerful what can happen when that one infection is removed from either a small group or a church or leadership. That is powerful. What an instructive lesson to churches of all generation of wild rebellion and how it creeps in subtly and what needs to be done to deal with it. Let's replace wild rebellion now, uh, which is why we need this. This is the last point, which is why we need patient submission. Patient submission. 
This is the counterpart of wild rebellion. In one of the seven correctives Jude ends with, he calls us to patient submission. Look at the verse. He says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Waiting for the mercy. Wild waves are reckless, impatient. They cause disruption, rebellion. In contrast, we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who have received mercy. We have been forgiven of our rebellion. Isn't that awesome? We once were wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of our own shame, wildly rebellious. And even when we were yet sinners, Christ forgave us. We now walk with a new posture. We once were wildly rebellious. We now walk with patient submission. We are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ who saved us by grace. We are washed, cleansed, forgiven. We are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We are submitted to the local leadership of the church. We submit ourselves one to another. We make it our aim to walk in unity and love and peace and harmony. We have a new posture in life, not to create disorder or disrupt believers, but we have a new mission to serve one another and all of it leads to eternal life. A wandering star, you don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it goes, it just shoots across the sky. Jude says, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever, but now we have a new destiny, don't we? As believers in Jesus Christ, we are now sealed with the Holy Spirit. We now are on a course, not for the gloom of utter darkness that has been reserved forever, we are on a course charted towards eternal life. And this is why Jude says that we are those who wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. It is patient submission. It is submitting ourselves to the Lord and to his church that he paid for with his blood. From the Lord Jesus, we have received mercy, and now we extend it to others with graciousness. We dwell with patient submission with one another, within our families, within our neighborhoods, and certainly within God's church, because this is his church. Our posture is one of patience, bearing with one another in love. Our posture is one of submission. What does it look like practically? Here's just a random sampling of 10 different ways to make this very practical. Uh, guard your speech from slander. Speak well of authority. Set an example of submission to leadership. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. Have a posture of humility in political disagreements. Be on guard of the critical spirits of others. Have courage to confront rebellion. Encourage a de church person to return to the church because they have probably been hurt or offended. Remember that you too are a recipient of God's mercy and wait patiently on the Lord's coming who will one day right every wrong. It's no mistake that Jude ends his book with this great and glorious theme. Could you be real still for this moment and listen to his words? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is our true north. He's our fixed point of reference. And it is him who is the Lord of our life and the Lord of his church. 
We celebrate his mercy. We live this out in patient submission one with another. And we overcome wild rebellion in our own hearts. Would you now submit your own heart to the Lord? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is instructive to the church. Not just for how we are to deal with wild rebellion in the church, but how we are to deal with it in our own hearts. Thank you, Lord, for this instructive lesson. Help us here at New Hope not to be pools without water, ports without dock, stable without horses. Help us not to be waterless clouds swept along by winds or wild waves of the sea casting up foam of our own shame. May we not be wandering stars, but may we be fixed upon the great and the glorious mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we never lose the wonder. May we never lose the wonder. May we never lose the wonder of the great mercy of our Lord Jesus.